opportunity to affect a better government go by. That's why I've attended council meetings for years, and that's why I speak. And that's why I look and listen, because the first step is education, and I have to know what's going on. You said something profound in your report. This just stuck out to me like a sore thumb, and I'm paraphrasing. You said, is it related to the water fund? Nobody was stealing when you looked. That's what it implied. Nobody was stealing. So I accept that as an update. But then I look back at the review board when they came in to recommend you come in. And if I'm mistaken, I want to look at it again. I hope the words don't change. It says there was unlawful transfers from the water fund and you somewhere. That was one of the stick out things, unlawful transfers. So what I'm saying to you is if you found that to be true, that there were no stealing, then guess what? They were wrong because in the old cookie jar days, when I would reach in the cookie jar and take something out of a fund or a cookie jar, I used to get my hand spanked. The cookie was good for what it was worth then, but we were taught it was taken wrongfully. That's the interpretation for stealing. So this, this is question and comment. You got to clear that up. Because if I read the report and it was unlawful transfers or unlawful taking, and then I hear you after the fact say it wasn't, then you came in on a flawed report. That's major. That's major. The council voted 7 to 2 not to appeal based upon the report. It's a fly in the suit. I've got to know what it is. And maybe you smile and maybe you know. Maybe I wasted three minutes of my time. But you said that. And I read that. And I'm confused. And I was always a, not always, but I was a 3.43 at Michigan State at one point. You got to clear that up. That's major. In addition to that, I think it's ironic that the water is all in the news. Water, bills, water, everywhere. I know that um, the two main resources, in my opinion, for the general fund, which is the deficit, is income tax revenue and property tax revenue. Income tax revenue and property tax revenue. I know some like to talk about revenue sharing and the like, but I'm looking at income tax revenue and property tax revenue. At 171000 for three years, if I'm you, I'm not going to fix it in one year. Three years, that's 500000 that's what you'd make in three years, 510000 I worked for General Motors, lived pretty good. I had some $60,000 years. Uh, 510000 that means you good. I'm telling you, you, you ain't that good. I'm going to tell you why. If it's income tax and property tax, mm -hmm. I got a protest. I might go to jail, but I won't do it long. If it's income tax and property tax, that means we got to get some revenue going. All of these plans, I don't see no revenue. You know I am, Matthew Chamber of Commerce, the governor is um, business. It's ironic that I look at that water. We selling water through the faucet, and I bet you this. Everybody in the city of Flint in Genesee County, if you bottled it up and put Flint on it, they would buy some. And you could generate millions of dollars of revenue off a bottle of water. And you can be out of here fast. The city sells water in the faucet form. They can sell it in a bottle form. They can get in on the shelves and generate revenue from here to Texas. And a reality. And I know that sometimes things are not always as they appear. But this is becoming abundantly clear. There was a plan out there, and I know you're going to say, oh, conspiracy theory. But there was a plan out there to run us away from the city. If all of the services are gone, and the tax revenue is gone, and the people leave, 
then the land can lay dormant for a few years, and you can come back, come back and redevelop it, and you can turn it into something else. There's also a name for that. It's called gentrification. It's when you run one people away from a certain area, and you come in and you rebuild it, and then those people can no longer afford to be there once it's rebuilt. And that's how it's looking like in Flint. It's looking that way. And I say that because I watch maybe too much TV, but I see it happening all across the country. And I see it happening in cities, in, in states, where the governors got together before the big election and decided that when we get in office, we're going to tax them, tax them, tax them. We're going to use their, their possessions, the city's possessions. We're going to take them, and we're going to create revenue for us. And we don't give a dog on what they say. And most of all, we're going to stamp on all the unions, because we got to get rid of those unions, because they're bad guys. They're the guys who created the middle, the middle class people. We got to get rid of them. So everything looks as if it's all about trying to destroy the little common person so that the person who has money can keep having money in his pocket. How many billions and millions can one person spend? There are so many things happening in this country, not just in Michigan, that really directly impacts us. You know, I, I always have a problem with people who live in other cities who come to Flint and tell us what to do. And I got to thinking about the governor. When it was time for him to take his oath of office, he let everybody know, I'm not moving to Lansing because my daughter doesn't want to go to school in Lansing. So he controls what happens from another city. So we pay for him to go back and forth to Lansing. Those kinds of things. Nobody's caring about the, the, the small guy, the common guy. You know, and what we're saying, I really think, is falling on deaf ears because actually, Mr. Brown doesn't make the decisions. The man in Lansing makes the decisions. He picks up the phone and says, I don't give a damn what they say. This is what I want it to be. So Mr. Brown has some enrolled, but he doesn't have complete enrolled. He doesn't. He works for the governor of the state of Michigan. He is an emergency manager who has come here to manage us, <laughs> to manage us. And so we're not getting anything for the bang for our, we're not getting a bang for our buck or anything like that. And it's really sad. It's sad that the city has come to this. This is a great city. It's sad that it's come to this. You, you see more and more businesses involved in your parks, businesses involved in everything that they usually don't be involved in. But now, all of a sudden, they want to be involved in So they want to take stuff away from us. They don't want to give us anything back. And so once they run us all out, they'll just rebuild downtown uh, North Saginaw. They'll build the north side up. I've already seen a picture of what Flint's going to look like in 2012. Ten. I've already seen a picture of what Flint's going to look like in 2012. And if anybody else is interested in seeing what it's going to look like in 2012, contact the University of Michigan. They came a couple of years ago and showed us. Good evening. My name is Paul Herring. I reside at 525 Mason Street. And I'm here um, and speaking because I can't be quiet. I just can't. You know, I, I can't. I see this on the news, and I'm, I'm hoping that everybody sees what I see, uh, Barbara. Your eyes are open. I'm hoping that everybody sees what I see. And it's blatantly obvious that, that, that we got some problems here. Some serious problems. You're talking about a Karagandhi water investment when we got the Kersley Reservoir that used to feed 200,000 people. You tell us that the water pipes are losing 30% of the water from Detroit, 40% of the water from Detroit, and we want to give them more money. We've got Swedish biogas out here that can't generate enough biofuel because they can't get enough waste to do it with. When are we going to start talking to the Davisons and the Swartz Creeks and, and maybe even the Lansings, Mike, and ask them for their crap so we can get the biodiesel going, the, 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 the biogas plant going? They should be willing to give us their crap because we're getting used to getting it here in the city of Flint. How can we even imagine investing in, in a plan, a water plan like that? It's just off the table. We're broke. Michael, we're broke. And broke people don't invest millions of dollars in water. Tell you what we need to do. We need to take some of these unemployed people in Flint 
and let them dig up the water pipes and fix them. All right? Pay the people that live in the city of Flint to stop that bleeding out of the water pipes. All right? That would be productive. That would be a win-win situation. We get new pipes, and unemployed people in Flint will get jobs. Let's think outside the box, or at least make the suggestion to the higher-ups. All right? We got problems here. We're broke. We're broke. And when you're broke, you don't do certain things. You just don't do it. You can't spend money you don't have, and you can't give away the money you do have. There's got to be a happy medium somewhere. Michael, please don't sign anything that lasts beyond your stay here. OK? If you want to give them an abatement and you think you're going to be here for three years, go three years. Because rest assured, I'll be at the microphone again asking that those abatements be rescinded. I'm embarrassed for the companies that would ask a bleeding corpse for money. We're broke. Why would you ask a broke city to give you 10 grand when you can already hire our employees at under minimum wages because we're that desperate for work? There's a plan.